Hey, Sweat Sisters, welcome to the Pretty Girl Sweat Show, which highlights women who are balancing demanding careers with a healthy lifestyle and hurtling over personal and professional obstacles. I'm your host, Aisha DeVore Branch, and each week I have a sister to sister chat with an inspiring go getter. And listeners learn how good things come to those who sweat. If this is your first time listening, what up? You could be anywhere in the world and you're here with me and I really appreciate that. If you love what you hear, take a second to subscribe to the podcast so you get updates every time we drop a new episode. If you got half a second, leave a rating, which will help other sweat sisters in need of some inspiration find our podcast. If you have a minute, please follow us across all social media platforms. We are at Pretty Girl Sweat on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter and YouTube. Use the hashtag Pretty Girl Sweat when sharing this episode. And if you have five minutes, please leave a review and let us know how we're doing. Hey, Sweat Sisters, you're listening to season three of the Pretty Girl Sweat Show. And on our 23rd episode, Christina Rice takes us through her journey as a risk taker and a self-starter. The serial entrepreneur, health and wellness influencer, certified yoga instructor, certified scuba diver, and travel enthusiast launched her first business at the age of 21 and hasn't slowed down since. From becoming a high-end boutique owner in Nashville, Tennessee, to transitioning to serving as a powerhouse publicist in NYC, the yoga enthusiast began experiencing entrepreneur burnout and decided to pursue her yoga teacher certification with a passion to share with other busy professionals what calm and peace yoga provided her. In 2017, she founded Omnoir, a social wellness platform for women of color and later moved the Omnoir headquarters from New York to Atlanta in order to expand the company's offerings to include workshops, events, and smaller one-day retreats to help women of color achieve 360 degrees of wellness in all areas of their lives. Take a listen to learn how being proactive with your health now determines how it shows up for you later. Welcome to the Pretty Girl Sweat Show. Thank you for having me. It is my pleasure. I'm so excited to speak with you today. It's been a long time coming. I guess yes. it has. <laughs> it really has. Yes. And I'm so blown away by the impact you were making online in the health space and the travel space. So I want to get into all of that later. But let's just begin where it all started. From little Christina in Akron, Ohio. Take us back to your childhood. <laughs> so I grew up in Akron, Ohio um, in a two-parent household. So it was me and my brother. He's four years older than me. And I also have a half-sister um, who is my father's daughter, but she's she's lived in California my whole life. So um, I get to see her when she takes her annual visits he, uh, to Ohio or um, or if I go and visit LA. So that was kind of like, um, you know, what it was growing up. But I would say kind of, and, and we'll probably, I know we'll talk about this later, but in terms of like, you know, nutrition education and um, just kind of like the history of my family, my family is from the South, um, both on my mother's side, both on my father's side. And of course, you know, you, you being here in Atlanta now, um, that we kind of like Southern tradition was very hearty, um, very, you know, uh, type of foods that were, you know, whether it was like kind of what you call the Southern comfort. Yeah. That's what I was looking for. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, even now as an adult and I have conversations with my audience, you know, understanding that most of us didn't grow up in households that even really had access to as much nutrition education as we do now. And so I would say like, even then, um, you know, kind of, I'm sure you probably experienced that too. It was like, you know, eat your greens, but it really was an education on what type of foods were good for us growing up, what, you know, what type of greens were good for this or vegetables were good for this and that kind of thing. It was just, it was kind of told to us instead mm -hmm. of educated, you know, instead of right. us being taught about it. And so of course, as children, we're going to rebel against that, you know, because we, you know, we weren't taught that these things were, um, 
nutritional for us, you know, as we grow and like all of those things. So um, even so now, you know, with my family, um, we do, and something I even uh, learned recently with that, we do have a history of high blood pressure. We do have a history of heart disease. And um, I'm fairly certain that, you know, a big part of that is that we need to start young enough um, being, you know, again, focused on our health, focus on uh, on our nutrition, and not that you know we can really fault our parents because that kind of education is is uh, taught through generations. You know what I mean? And so um, now, you know, I just make it a point when I speak to women my age, women that who that do have younger children, that is now is the time to really get them on the path to healthy eating. I couldn't agree with you more. There's so many things that I'm learning about my family's health now yes. at this age. And I'm like, wow, why didn't y'all tell me this stuff? Like, because like, you go into the doctor's office and they're like, hey, so does your family have a history of blah, 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 blah? I'm like, I don't know. Let me call my parents and see. Like, you know, most families don't have those conversations. Right, exactly. And I'm, you know, same thing. You know, I I just recently learned about um, my my family on my grandmother's side, like her sister died from heart disease. And like so many people, you know, on that side of the family have passed away or do suffer from it. And so I, you know, it's so important to have those conversations early so that again, once your child grows up to be an adult and they are now tackling their health, you know, on their own, that they do know one, their, their, their history, but also they know what questions to ask mm -hmm. um, when they do go to the doctor and like things like that. So uh, I think I think we're going to see a shift. And I think, you know, Pretty Girl Sweat is, is such a big part of that evolution as well, is that we're going to start to see, you know, parents being a lot more educated, um, even partnering with their children on what foods they really like and then pairing that with things that are healthy. You know what I mean? Right. Um, and, and, and looking at it as like a partnership instead of, you know, just like, this is what you do because I tell you to do it. It's like, this is what you do because you will live a long and healthy life. Right. And that's a different conversation. Totally different. So nutrition may have not been uh, at the forefront in your family, but what about being active or playing sports. Did you do any of that growing up? I did. Um, and that was something that wasn't that prevalent in my family. Um, my, me and my brother were both athletes and we had a, and our cousin, like my favorite cousin who is the same age as my brother. So we were all athletes. Like he played football, my cousin did, but me and my brother, we both played basketball, also ran track. And this was all through middle school and high school. And then when I got to college, um, I didn't have a scholarship. I mean, I almost kind of made a basketball scholarship happen. But okay. but once I got there, I just I wasn't really that much interested in sports. And I can't even pinpoint why. Mm -hmm. um, I think one I mean, one time I did try I did try out to be a, a majorette and I was terrible. But <laughs> <laughs> so that was active to some degree. <laughs> I, I just don't have rhythm um, or like, I, I don't know what word it is, but like just retention on different moves, dance moves. Uh -huh. I, I didn't pursue any kind of athletic career in college, but I, I, I think that me growing up in sports is what kind of maybe put me ahead of the curve in terms of like, um, maintaining a certain weight throughout my adulthood, you know, up until maybe like recently, uh, I've always kind of been like just about the same size. And I think that one that's important that as we are developing as adults um, and, you know, in our childhood and our preteens and teens that we are active because it shows up in a good way later on as you yes. get older you know weight gain of course illnesses too are not as prevalent because you started that in a development stage so your body has muscle memory muscle memory got me through all of my kids yes <laughs> like i do now if it wasn't for playing sports all through um high school so oh wait speaking of that let's go back mm -hmm. to that for a second um since you played basketball and you ran track was there a yes. coach that really impacted your life during that time uh, well, the, we had two. We had our track coach, Coach Richardson, and of course, I'm like, oh, I can't think of his name. Um, he was our basketball coach, and it'll probably come to me 
at some point, but he was, they, both of them were just coaches, but also mentors. Even like Mrs. Richardson, like we used to, it was me and my two best friends who both play basketball and ran track. Like we were so close to her. Like we used to like babysit her son. So all three of us would just go over there and babysit her son while she, you know, may have had a a evening out with friends or something like that. So I wish I was still, um, actually she passed away maybe about eight or nine years ago. And I wish we had stayed in contact, um, you know, through my adulthood because she was really a pivotal uh, figure in my life. Wow. Do you think there's anything that maybe she told you or opened your eyes to about yourself that, you know, is still playing a major role in your life today? Mm, I think, I don't know if it was necessarily words, so to speak. I mean, you know, she she really kind of set this very disciplined tone within Mm -hmm. us. I do remember is that she was just such a positive figure for us. And especially me and my, my two best friends who... Uh, oh, I'm sorry, my three best friends, it was four of us that actually ran track and, and played basketball. And um, we, I just remember that we looked at her as like a mother figure because we could tell that it came from a point of love and care and concern for us to to grow up to be, you know, classy, you know, women and, um, and of course, educated. So that was really important to her that if our grades did not maintain a level of excellence, mm-hmm. then we would be we would be benched. <laughs> and as much as we love track, I did hurdles and I and also the two hundred and all that stuff. So as much as I love that, like I was like, I have to make sure that my grades are on point so that I do not miss out on something that I absolutely love. Wow. Okay, coach. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) All right. So then you made the decision to go to Tennessee State University. Why did you choose that school? I chose that school because I wanted to go to HBCU. I wanted to get out of Akron. I really wanted to get out of Ohio. Mm -hmm. And I went to visit TSU and I just loved being down south. Like I visited my family down south with my parents almost like every year since I remember, I loved it. So when I came to TSU and, and this was my first time even being in, in Nashville, I just felt like home and they offered me a scholarship. So that was really a determining factor too. I got almost a full scholarship in academics. So that was like, oh, well, there you go. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, it was such an amazing experience. What was your major? It was business information systems and I minored in computer science. BIS uh, is basically what technology is today. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, at the time, a lot of things that we learned was how to build a hotel's like reservation system or how to build like a checkout system at a retail store. And interestingly enough, though, I did not, when I graduated, I wasn't interested in pursuing that career. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't even sure what I wanted to do at the time. But, you know, maybe about six months after I graduated, I decided to to open up a clothing store. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Learning so much about you. Okay, so then. I know. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so you open up this clothing store. What were your expectations? What were my expectations? Well, I mean, I had big dreams of having like a chain of stores and uh, it did really well for the time. that It it always had done well. I mean, I was the first black woman to open up a a boutique in Nashville. Wow, that's amazing. And um, thank you. And it, you know, and it was I think maybe took a lot of people by the surprise, the type of of merchandise that I, that I had, like, it was very like sophisticated in the sense that, you know, it was like seven jeans and, um, BCBG and like, I'm this 21 year old black girl, you know, in a predominantly white town that opens up this like major store. What was the name of the store? It was called uh, Foxy Couture. Okay, okay. Yes. And so um, it was, I had two locations. Well, one location was like this really small store that was kind of like off the beaten path. Um, But I still would get tons of customers that would drive to me. And then I moved to a bigger store that was right across from Vanderbilt University. Oh, wow. So we had tons of foot traffic. We had tons of just... Of course, like Vanderbilt students that have daddy's credit right. card, even like celebrities. I remember like um, 
Natalie Cole was a client. Oh, good. Yeah. Uh, yeah, she would come in a lot of like, um, you know, Tennessee Titans were there. So a lot of their wives would shop in the store. So yeah, so I, had, I had it open for you got, I'm like, five you gotta years. rewind. I'm like, okay, so you had it open mm-hmm. for five years, but now I'm just thinking mm-hmm. from the perspective of a college student who's like, wow, I'm really into fashion. I want to open my own store, but literally don't know how to get started. Can you just like speak to that person out there? Okay. Well, now, so it's a lot different now. Okay. I mean, we didn't really have the internet. Oh my God, I'm like aging myself, which is so crazy that we didn't really really have Google or like the wealth of information just accessible to our fingertips. So what I did is I spent like eight hours a day in Barnes and Noble and for just months and I would just research and read all of these different books about opening up a retail store. I mean, we had some Google, but it wasn't as, you know, as sophisticated as now. And the first thing I, you know, started to research beyond like the financial stuff was just where to buy merchandise. Mm. And so I, you know, of course the biggest trade shows were here in New York and that's where I came. Thankfully at the time too, you know, and this is so important and we're kind of getting a little bit away from initial conversation, but it all, it all ties into is that, you know, good credit, you know, in college. And I know that's something that a lot of college students uh, suffer from when they graduate is they don't have good credit. And I did at the time. So when I went to these trade shows with even just, I didn't even have any merchandise in my store. I was able to get like net 60 net 90, even net 120. I don't know if they do that now um, as much, but I was able to get a lot of merchandise on, on credit, so to speak. And then of course it would come to my store. I'd be able to sell it. And then I could pay Mm -hmm. um, kind of like that, that credit with that particular company, you know, like a BCBG or seven jeans or AG jeans, like any of those. So that was, and then I had, I had credit cards, you know, because of course they give us credit cards in college, (laughs) (laughs) but that, that is what really helped me to at least get my initial merchandise. Um, And then at the time, like I, you know, Nashville is small in terms of the people, you know, the circles that we ran into. So it was like, oh, does anybody know like a painter? And like, that is not going to charge me a gazillion dollars. And so I used a lot of friendships and relationships to help me kind of build the store. A combination of hustle and research and relationships to help me open that first initial store. Okay. And then you made the transition at some point into PR. Yes. I I had the store open for a little under five years, I would say. And I just got burned out. I'm a young woman. And I have this big 5,000 square foot store. I have tons of, you know, expenses. And I just was like, I just, I don't know if I want to handle this kind of stress at this age Mm -hmm. right now. In terms of just like, you know, it was just a huge, huge responsibility. And I was doing it all myself. Mm -hmm. And then I also got into a point where I was ready to leave Nashville Mm -hmm. And so I was just, you know, I just had to make a decision. Like, do you want to continue on and maybe you'll open up a second store or whatever, or do you want to kind of explore other things while you're still young? I, at 26, I decided to sell the store. I actually sold the store to a a Titans player wife. She wanted to open up a boutique. So she ended up really buying every, almost everything that I had, like my, my inventory, my, my store racks and just furniture and everything. And she was going to open in a different location. And she, I don't think she, she didn't end up, end up doing it. Um, I think she kind of maybe started something, but I don't know if she kind of yeah. saw it all the way through. So I used that money and my savings and I had friends who lived in New York and they were in the music industry. And so they were like, just come up and, you know, you can stay with us for a little bit and, you know, kind of figure out the lay of the land and what you want to do next. And so 
I, I moved up here, put my stuff in storage and oh, I keep saying up here, but now I'm in Atlanta, yeah. but I moved to New York and I uh, had my stuff in storage for a little bit. I stayed with my friends probably like three months and then I found a place and then I was like, okay, now I maybe took about six months off and I was like, okay, now it's time for me to find a job. And ironically, one of them uh, said to me, oh, you would be a great publicist. And I didn't know what that was. Like, I was like, I don't know what a publicist does. And so I research. If there's a recurring <laughs> yes. thing with me that you will know, I am a research queen. I Google everything. Now Google right. is on a pop and now, <laughs> now, <laughs> now I can find anything on the internet. And so I just, I, I Googled it and I was like, oh, so a publicist assists their clients in getting press and media opportunities and I was like, well, I did that for my store. Like I got tons of press. I knew how to kind of write up what they call like a pitch. And, um, and initially I said that, you know, or initially I was like, well, I would do good in fashion because I have a, a boutique right. background. Like I know the background of running a retail business, but I also know the front end of it too. And so um, I started, you know, reaching out to different companies. I actually did an internship. Oh, let me backtrack. Before I decided to, before I kind of discovered PR, I, I wanted to be okay. a sales rep. You know, I was like, well, I can kind of switch gears now. I used to work with sales reps for my merchandise for my store. Now I can be a sales rep. And so I reached out to several different companies that I used to buy from. And they were like, well, you don't uh, have any experience. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like right. I owned a store. Like if nothing else, I know how to sell merchandise. And so I was like, well, you know what? I will do an internship. I did an internship with Frankie B. Do you remember Frankie B? Yeah, I sure do. I used to carry them in my store. And so I, you right. know, hit the ladies I work with and I was like, look, I would love to do an internship. And so um, I, I think I, I interned with them for like two months. And then that's when I did the shift. But you know what the lesson here, and I think, a lot of uh, young people struggle with is taking a step back mm -hmm. and they feel like they are like taking a step back in life when you have to kind of start over. But that's where you, well, one, when you're pivoting careers, that's that, you know, naturally is going to happen. You're not going to start at, at an executive level. You know what I mean? And sometimes you have to take that step back so you can relearn and unlearn certain things and then you can kind of, and then you can push forward in your career. So, you know, here I am, like I'm 27. I haven't, I'm doing an internship, 26, 27. I have an internship and I loved it actually, to be honest with you. I love being around all the merchandise. I love um, kind of learning the ropes of being a sales rep, but ultimately I knew that I needed to eventually get a job. And so I shifted into looking at uh, PR companies. And so I probably, Maybe my second company that I put, I sent a resume out to, they called me in and interviewed me and they hired me like the next day. Oh. All right. So would you say that was the biggest risk you ever took for your career or would you say something else was? Oh, the biggest risk? I am such a risk taker. <laughs> I would say definitely moving to New York was probably my biggest risk, but it was also my biggest reward and I love taking risks. So for me, that's kind of like an adrenaline rush. It's almost like a test to myself, uh, what I can make out of it. You know what I mean? Like a lot of, where a lot of things scare people, for me, it's like exciting uh, to be afraid to do something because that's when you really kind of, where it's really a test of your character yeah. and a test of your hustle and your, your faith in yourself. So I would say probably maybe moving to New York with like no prospects, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And only knowing a, the, the, the four friends that were there, you know, and to, and I made a whole 15 year career out of that, that helped me transition to the one I'm in now. So you've had several fearless transitions yes. and throughout it all, how did your health uh, play a part in it? Well, you know, I probably, to be honest with you, I probably did not truly focus on my health until about three or four years ago. Mm -hmm. Like I will always say, oh, let me go to the gym. And I would, you know, like I would start off in the gym and I'd go hard for like 
two months and then I fall off. And then it, it, it'll be six months before I go back into the gym. And then I will try kickboxing. And then, you know, I go hard for two months, love it. And then I fall off. And so I, I just kind of had this love-hate relationship with it where I just did it because I felt like I should, you know. And of course, as we start to get older, we, we see changes. We do start to, you know, um, gain weight a little bit easier or we kind of notice that maybe we're not as energetic as we used to be, that kind of thing. And so, you know, I would do it because I'm like, well, I should, you know, and I do want to, you know, a six pack for a vacation kind of thing. And so it wasn't until I actually started taking yoga and I, I discovered how much I loved it. And it became not just a necessity, but a need for me in, in the sense that I could see the changes and I, I love practicing yoga. So then it was like, I, I don't want to miss a day, you know, or at least two or three days kind of thing. But I think really when it comes to exercise is really kind of finding the thing that you really love and you can't live without and using that as your foundation. Because once I fell in love with yoga and I was practicing that consistency, consistently, excuse me, then I started wanting to try other things because I had my base. So then it was like, well, you know, well, today I'm just going to go spinning. And then tomorrow, you know, I'm going to go, um, go do area yoga. And then maybe another day I'll go take a kickboxing class, but then I will always come back to my yoga. And then on more, I'm sure. And then yoga, on more. Yeah. Yoga yes. had a huge uh, role in that. So let's talk yes. about this beautiful uh, platform you've created. Oh, thank you. Um, so Om Noir came about because it's now 2019. So 2015, I was going through a really difficult time in my life. I mean, I was burnt out again. You know, entrepreneurs, we, we, we go through cycles of burnout and sometimes it's kind of very light and maybe you don't even notice it. It's just that you go through a period where just like, I'm super tired. I'm not that motivated, but then you kind of jump back into gear. The two times that I've, that has really kind of pivoted my life, uh, with the boutique years ago. And then, and then now, um, as a publicist, and then I was also going through a bad breakup. And so I was depressed and I was gaining weight. I wasn't really eating well. Um, and I wasn't of course moving. And that's when I actually had dinner with my former assistant and she had lost a ton of weight and she looked amazing. She was just glowing. And I'm like, what are you doing? Because whatever that is, I need it. And she said she was taking a $5 yoga class. That was two blocks from my office. The studio was two blocks from my office. And I was like, I have to try that. And to try it in a sense that I had taken yoga before, but a lot of us know that with these boutique fitness classes, you know, $25, $30 a class can get very expensive. Yes. And that's another reason why a lot of us fall off from working out is because you just, you can't barely afford it, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, and so me going, you know, to this $5 yoga class, I mean, I was going like five times a week. And, um, and that's when I fell in love with it. But that's when I also, you know, decided that I wanted to get deeper in my practice. And so I decided to go, you know, go through a yoga teacher training at the studio. And the one thing I noticed once I started in that teacher training, and it was 50, 52 of us that I was the only black one as a student. And then as a teacher, so these three different phases of my practice and my yoga journey, I would be most of the times the only black woman, the only person of color. And I noticed at that time too, that a lot of black women would seek out my classes and they would ask me when I was teaching, it was kind of like a light bulb moment. Like, oh, women of color want to be taught by a woman of color. And mm -hmm. a lot of people don't, a lot of non black people don't understand that. But anytime, most, most, most times when I say that to another woman of color, she absolutely understands that. And she understands that from, for so many different reasons that's, you know, 
from aesthetically, when you walk in a yoga studio, you see a size two white woman that can bend over backwards, right? And so it, it feels very intimidating because your body doesn't move like that. You're, maybe you don't feel as comfortable and as confident in you know, a yoga outfit or workout outfit. So you're thinking about all of these things as you're trying to go, as you're trying to practice a practice that is about loving yourself from the inside out. And it's hard to, when you don't see it reflected in you. You know, I came up with the name Om Noir and it started off as an Instagram page. And it was really just highlighting women of color and wellness. You know, whether you were thin or curvy, short, tall, whatever it was, natural hair, long hair, whatever. And also kind of just showing that there's a black yoga teacher in Missouri. There is a black Pilates instructor in Florida. Like there are women out there that teach that you just need to have access to. You have to know that they're out there. Mm -hmm. And so that you, if this is a practice that you want to, you want to explore, then you know that this will be a safe space and you're going to see yourself reflected hopefully in these classes. And so a woman that is a mutual friend of a friend of mine, she had approached me because she's also in a wellness space. And she had asked me if I ever thought about doing a yoga retreat. And I had, but I was also very busy in my PR company at the time. And so it kind of just seemed like a big undertaking mm -hmm. and something I couldn't 100% focus on. And so she was like, I will, I will work with you to, to produce this. And so that was around March, 2017, we put together this whole retreat that was in Grenada, which is like my favorite place on earth to go to. And so I announced this retreat and I couldn't believe the response that we got, but in total, we had 53 women from all over the world at this retreat, October, 2017. And I would say that, that is kind of the, the launch pad um, for Om Noir to where it is today incredible see how things happen yes see really your assistant pushing you to, well actually just showing up right and just glowing that day and you're like what are you doing <laughs> exactly <laughs> let me, yes. try, that. Let me oh, try that yes oh my gosh that's so incredible okay so Omnoir today is still doing incredible um, experiences for women um, in different areas all across the globe where do you see it going next hmm there's, oh, so many things. You know, of course we're going to continue hosting retreats. We're going to pivot um, our retreat, so to speak, where we, they have, they are geared towards a very specific individual, whether that is maybe like executives, you know, an executive level retreat because corporate women have some of the most high stress, you know, and high risk jobs in terms of their health. You know, we would love to provide a space where, one, they are, you know, very like-minded in a sense of their careers, but also, you know, an opportunity for them to be able to take a step back and, um, and foster like with companies, you know, what are kind of like our pitches, like you send your executives to business conferences, but what else are you doing to help foster their leadership right. from a holistic standpoint? Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things. And then in Grenada, we're doing our second retreat in Grenada, which I never expected to want to repeat locations because it's so much of the world to see. But um, Grenada, one is, like I said, my favorite place on earth. But um, I have so so many relationships there that we were like, let's do a co-ed retreat there. So this retreat is going nice. to be for men and women. Oh, fun. October 2019. And couples and singles, like we have couples that have booked. We have singles. And it's really about um, you know, creating healthy spaces for us to thrive together and to be around people who have the same interests, right? And that's really healthy communication, healthy interactions and healthy relationships. This is so good. Okay. So first of all, I haven't been to Grenada once, so I'm like, whoo, I need to, you have to be, <laughs> have listen, to go. I've been to so many have places. To go. Oh my gosh. I know. Okay. Got to get, got to get my Google, Google popping off and do some research. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, but okay. So October, this retreat's going down. Um, so make sure everyone, where can they get information on this retreat? If they're interested in coming, uh, it is at, uh, on our website. So it's omnoir.com, which is O M N O I R E.com. 
And of course our social media, which is Om Noir. Um, and then let's see, you know, of course our newsletter too. So everybody is not on social media 24 hours a day. Shocking. So the best way to make sure you don't miss any announcements is to sign up for our newsletter. And then we're also going to host like smaller retreats here in Atlanta that are only going to be for 10 per 10 people max. Awesome. And I felt that would be, um, kind of like a good balance because most of my bigger retreats, as amazing as they are and as much, you know, education and just self-care and all of that stuff that we give to, to our attendees that, um, you know, with a smaller retreat, we're able to provide even more. Mm -hmm. And some people need like a lot more immersive, you know, just uh, work, whether it's like sound bowl therapy or Reiki or just even conversation amongst a smaller group about things that you're challenge with or you're suffering from or things like that. So um, I'm going to actually probably announce those by next week. Okay. And I'll probably have just four dates and people can sign up. And I think that'll be a good balance between, you know, for our bigger retreats, a nice compliment for us to have the smaller ones. I can agree with you more. And just think about the lifetime friendships people will make at these experiences. Uh, yes. And they uh, have like every retreat. It's like groups of pockets of friends that come out of it. I've even had women that have gone into business together. Wow. Um, yeah. Some are just like super close. And yeah, I mean, but the, you know, the idea is that we have to start stepping out of our own circles and not that you can love your friends. Like, for your entire life, but it's also important to build different tribes, I believe. Yeah. I think that, you know, at certain stages of your life, your friends may not be your main go-to because they may be at a different stage in their life. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. if you're going through a difficult breakup and all your friends are in a happy relationship, right. like it's hard, you know, it's hard to like have those conversations you know, with, with people that don't understand. And so, you know, one of the things I always say is like at our retreats, like you're going to find a woman or several that can understand either what you're going through or what you've been through. We have a lot of women that, you know, maybe they've gone through a divorce, right? So that's mm -hmm. somebody that you would connect to or has survived an illness like cancer. Like that's somebody, you know, you can, that can relate to, you could talk about your journey that is different than, you know, maybe your friends at home that have no idea what it's like to go through um, cancer treatments, you know? So I think that's, these are opportunities for you, like I said, to build different tribes mm -hmm. for different stages of your life. And that doesn't mean you don't love people that have been there for you any less. It's just that you're finding different support systems. And I think it's important that we have those. That's true. Got to get out of our comfort zones, meet new people, because mm -hmm. amazing things can blossom from that. So I can agree with you more. All right. We're going to wrap this up with some rapid fire questions. Are uh -oh. you ready? <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's I'm ready. The, yeah. Let's just say the first thing that comes to your mind. Okay. Okay. All right. So your favorite book. Oh, my favorite book is The Five People You Meet in Heaven. Oh, I gotta write that one down. Okay. All right. So in what way have you invested in yourself throughout the years? Saying no. Oh, yes. Okay. What's one small thing you do each day that makes you happy? Oh, one small <laughs> thing. One small thing I do every day that makes me happy. I I work on the work that I love. Okay. And mm -hmm. how's your sleep? Fantastic. <laughs> how many hours do you get a day you think between six to eight okay not too bad what what's uh your number one way to make fitness fun my number one way to make fitness fun um i well my number i mean i just that's a hard one okay my <laughs> number one way to make the one way i make fitness fun is that i work out with my girlfriends Oh, yes. That is always the best. Okay. Yes. Um, what's always in your gym bag? Water bottle. Okay. What can make or break your workout? Large gyms. Okay. I don't like a lot of people. Okay. Yeah. Um, if I were to go in your phone and look at your workout playlist, what would be the most played song? <laughs> <laughs> 
Bounce It by Juicy J. Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, what do you think your life would be like right now if you weren't working out? Oh, gosh. Um, miserable and sick. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> what is uh, a meal that you typically eat before working out? Oh, a meal? Or can I say like a snack that I have? Yeah, it could be a snack too. A banana. Okay. And what about afterwards? Pasta. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what is one way you eat healthy on a budget? Salads. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, what do you eat on a cheat day? <laughs> when I eat on a cheat day. So, you know, I'm veganish. So uh-huh. I would say a mozzarella cheese pizza. Ooh, good. Okay. Mm-hmm. What is your favorite deodorant? Ooh, I, it's called Alvira and it is all natural. Oh, nice. Okay. Where'd you get that? Like Whole Foods or? I get it from uh, Amazon, which I believe okay. they sell it. Oh, I'm sorry. It's called, yes, Alvera, A-L-V-E-R-A. And it's all natural. So I stopped using um, regular deodorant like three years ago. Okay. Mm-hmm. And a beauty product that it's like, say if you're traveling mm-hmm. and you forget this beauty product, you would drive all the way back home to get it and go back to the airport. My, oh, <laughs> Jeez, like everything. Um, <laughs> lashes. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and when you hear the words pretty girls sweat, what do they mean to you? That being fit is an inside job and that's where you find your beauty. Wow. Awesome. <laughs> You said that so lovely. Okay. (laughs) I was like, that was beautiful. All right. So what's next for you? Oh, I got it. What's next for me is I have to finish my house. You know, when you move and you start off putting all your furniture in and then you have a, you stop because you get busy. And so now Mm -hmm. I have to finish, I'm committed to finishing, decorating my house, my new house here in Atlanta um, in July. And then for Homme Noir is to open up our wellness space. Love it. Love it. Okay. I had to add another question mm-hmm. because decorating is a an amazing thing. Where do you normally like to go for your decor? Ah, home goods. Oh, your home goods is yes. the plug. It is the plug. World market is the plug too. Oh, wait, what is this? Well, well market? Co- cost plus world market. Oh, hold on. Let me write this down. Okay. That's just where it's here in Atlanta. You don't know where that or... is. No, I don't. Oh, I'm like, girl. you're just putting me on. I'm like typing right now. You've been here longer than me. <laughs> I don't go many places. Okay. Okay. Call okay. I yeah, that yeah, you can have to text that to me. Okay. I need to take a look. So they have everything there. Home Goods does. Cost Plus has a lot of like you know, more decor items in terms of like patio, like just beautiful stuff, um, beautiful rugs, beautiful light fixtures. Um, but I also heard, and maybe we'll make a date together, is this okay. place called At Home. Ooh, and it's like home goods on steroids. Oh my gosh, I got it. We got to go. Yes. We got to go. We got to go. Okay, perfect. Because I literally just found out today that I either... I might be moving No, <laughs> at the end of July. I'm like, oh my gosh, moving not far, like maybe down the block. Oh, but, okay. um, yeah. I have to decide whether or not we want to stay here or if we want to move into another house. So I will Got be it. doing some shopping. Okay. Right, so yes. We have a, a shopping play date. All right. Well, this has been so much fun. I have learned so much about you. And when we do meet up for this play date, I'll let you know how much we have in common. Cause just listening to your story, I was like, oh my gosh, that's me. That's me. That's me. Right. That's me. That's me. That's me. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again, Christina, for sharing your amazing story with us. And we hope to have you back another time. Yes. Thank you for having me. And that's Christina. Be sure to follow her on social media at Christina M. Rice and also at her company page at Om Noir. You can also check out her company website, omnoir.com. Join us on Saturday, September 14th for the third annual Pretty Girl Sweat Fest Atlanta. Grab your squad for the ultimate Sweat Sisterhood Fitness Festival. Register to receive exclusive access to elite trainers. Because with heart-pumping workouts coupled with the dopest female DJs, you'll get a first-class ticket to your favorite fitness trends and hit songs. When you're not sweating it out, you can rehydrate at our SIP stations, refuel in our Savor Garden filled with deliciously healthy food trucks, refresh in our Style Lounge, and shop in our Vendor Village. Head on over to prettygirlsweat.com slash PGSF to get your tickets today before they're gone. 
Just one more thing before you take off. Do you want to get a short email from Pretty Girl Sweat every Monday and Friday that serves as a daily dose of all things inspiring and allows you priority access to our upcoming events? Just go to prettygirlsweat.com. That's Pretty Girls with an S, sweat.com. Drop in your email and you'll get the very next one. And if you sign up, you'll soon discover that there's no hood like sisterhood. Until next time, always remember that good things come to those who sweat.